You might hear a hammering noise. They're driving fence posts out near my deep rural place. Um, all right, so I'm going to try to do some kind of justice to Frega's sense and reference uh, in our Zoom class on Tuesday. Um, meantime, I thought I would do a, a, maybe a couple or a few uh, fairly brief um, video lectures on Frege's classic paper, Thoughts. Um, I, I wouldn't regard either of them as more fundamental in a way, conceptually. Uh, they're both um, classics that really set out a series, a, a very definite point of view, um, maybe the formative point of view of analytic philosophy, or, and certainly analytic philosophy of language. Um, they both elucidate basic concepts. Uh, sense of reference was quite a bit earlier than thoughts, uh, but they don't have to be taken in any particular order. Uh, I think neither each set sheds a lot of light on the other. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna okay. So I'm I'm gonna just concentrate on the first couple of pages of this thing for a minute because there's so much going on, uh, and it would be useful to be as clear as possible about it. And actually, Frege, you know, when you really pull it apart, uh, as you might just kind of pick up from the tone, uh, is unbelievably clear. Uh, <laughs> and that's one thing that certainly people admired about him. And it's one thing that was uh, the, 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 that aesthetic of clarity, um, no nonsense clarity is, uh, was as influential maybe as uh, specific uh, ideas that he put out there. But those were extremely influential too. Um, all right. So uh, thoughts starts out like this. Just as beautiful points the way for aesthetics. Just as beautiful the word points the way for aesthetics and good, single quotes, the word good uh, for ethics. Um, so do words like true for logic. All right, so the goal of ethics is moral goodness, I guess, doing the good. Um, that is what orders the whole realm uh, and provides it with its kind of, with its point. Um, without the value of moral goodness or something, there is no uh, ethical discourse. Um, it's the organizing principle as beauty for aesthetics, let's say, or the arts. At least it, you might have conceived it that way circa 1900, I suppose. Um, and true for logic. And also maybe a, for epistemology. Right? The goal is truth. In some sense, this is a, 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 quite a traditional conception of philosophy. Um, kind of thinking of, about uh, if he is conceiving philosophy, which I think he is more or less, um, as being concerned with these ultimate values in different domains of value, different dimensions of value, moral, aesthetic, epistemic, logical, maybe I'm kind of asserting that both of those uh, deploy truth as a kind of ultimate value. All right. Um, now, um, all sciences, he says, have truth as their goal. Now, the first set of moves he makes is, is what might be referred to as anti-psychologism. Logic tells you the laws of truth. As logic was usually conceived right through the 19th century, or at least what people said about it. Um, and I mean, a good example of this is actually uh, John Dewey, the American pragmatist. When he goes to define logic in his book, Logic, the Theory of Inquiry, the logic gave principles for thinking, okay? Logic was, in some sense, psychologically descriptive. It's, it's about the way we do reason. Inference or reasoning 
or argumentation and so on. These are human cognitive activities. And so logic was conceived, I mean, many people literally just said this, as a branch of psychology. Well, Frege's having none of that. And this is also a kind of formative thought. Um, it may be that, I mean, it could well be, and it may actually be, it's possible that, and it may be actual that, human inferential, uh, the ways we actually draw inferences are flawed. What if they were? What if we, and, and they are, all right? So like, in other words, we, uh, for example, the kind of reasoning you do when you stereotype, you, you, you know, you kind of like drop something or someone into a category and then you start uh, drawing um, uh, conclusions willy nilly from their membership in that category that they share all kinds of uh, properties with your idea of what that content of that category is. Now that leads to many mistakes. Maybe it's unavoidable in some sense, just in the, you know, like it, it's a product of our capacity or the necessity for inductive reasoning, just really badly applied. And we do that all the time. Um, so let's just say that the psychological laws of reasoning were flawed. Still logic, as Frege set it out, for example, in his Begriffschrift, the conceptual notation, would still be completely valid as uh, whether even anybody knew them or not. Actually, a number of the uh, contributions of Frege to logic were unknown before Frege put them out there. And yet they were always valid. Okay. Uh, and maybe, uh, you know, little pieces of actual human reasoning corresponded to them, actually, or showed that they... Uh, you know, made use of these um, logical principles that were only fully codified symbolically in Frege's logic. But um, so look, so he's, what he's saying is the laws of truth are completely independent from the laws of human thinking, whatever those might be. Which is not to say that we can't have any access to these actual laws of thinking because we can do systematic logic very carefully, right? Um, so, um, I mean, this, this kind of thing establishes all sorts of conclusions, actually. One thing it is, is a, a strongly anti-idealist position. Um, Frege, okay, we're not making up this reality or the reality of, say, mathematical truths or logical truths, or ordinary physical reality from our concepts, we are discovering it. Now, that might not sound that crazy, but it ran against the whole consensus of philosophy since Kant, at least since Kant, but long before Kant, even, uh, that um, what we're experiencing in some sense is our own ideas. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, in Hegel, for example, the whole universe is, is kind of human psychology writ large. You know, it's, uh, it's a conscious process. The, uh, the history of the universe is a, con a, a, product, a product of developing consciousness. Maybe it's God's consciousness, but it's our consciousness too, actually, in Hegel. Uh, well, like I say, uh, Frege's having none of that, man. He's like, truth is it's hard man and it's independent of what we whatever psychological processes we might be engaged in all right um all right um so i just i'll read a passage this is from the bottom of the first page uh of the select of the uh, archive of thoughts and so they might come uh, a law of thought would be a, a psychological law a law of logic would be a psychological law on the position that, um, you know, inference is a psychological process. Logic is the science of inference. So logic is a branch of psychology. Um, 
And so they came to believe that logic deals with mental, the mental process of thinking and with the psychological laws in accordance with which this takes place. That would be misunderstanding the task of logic, for truth has not been given its proper place. Out there, not in here. Error and superstition have causes just as much as correct co cognition. Our psychology is just as capable of producing, churning out, obviously, as churning out falsehoods as it is churning out truths. Um, the laws of psychology definitely are not the laws of logic, all right? The laws by which, the principles by which we do draw inferences are not the principles by which we should draw inferences, which can be set out in logical systems. Um, whether um, what you take for true is false or true, your so taking it comes about in accordance with psychological laws. We're just as suited to turn out falsehoods as truths. Uh, and everything we come to believe or assert, you know, there's reasons that, you know, there's an explanation for that in terms of our psychology. Right. So, I mean, psychology is irrelevant. To our, the psychology of any given person, or even all of us together, is irrelevant to what is actually scientifically, objectively true. Or something like that. Frege also thinks that mathematical truths, um, for example, and logical truths, are independent of human psychology, fully independent of human psychology. This is a position known as Platonism, all right, after Plato's forms. Um, although, I don't think Frege is going for a full-scale metaphysics along those lines, but he does think that uh, mathematical truths uncovers a level of reality a level of truth um, fully independent of the human mind. Everyone could have made a mistake about mathematics. Do you see what I mean? Like it has its own standards, right? uh, its own structure, which we can get right or wrong. We can discover or fail to discover. Same with logic. Um, and, but I think he's also realist about just the external world of, is, that we're studying scientifically. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter if everybody thinks the world is flat. You know, uh, it's not. Um, okay. Um, a derivation of a claim or a, of a, a, a process of infer inference from psychological laws, an explanation of a mental process that ends in taking something to be true, like the, the psychological processes that actually cause us to believe, that is, take something to be true. Uh, the psychological processes can never produce any kind of proof that something is true. The validity of proof is external to anyone's uh, beliefs about it. Now, you don't have to necessarily accept this, but it's a compelling picture. And, it, uh, you know, it actually makes sense of a lot of the way we talk about these things. Uh, I mean, I think that I've just made sense, right? When I say, like, the truth about these matters is independent of what everybody, anybody thinks about it. That's a position we might call... Realism. I don't know if I, you know, metaphysical realism. The truth is independent of what anybody or everyone takes it to, to be. I don't know if you can agree with that. That is my position, by the way. I don't know about the mathematics and the reality of uh, abstract objects like that. Uh, I'm a little less comfortable with that. But anyway, um, Okay, now, 
now he goes on to some very profound observations about the concept of truth. And again, the whole purpose of this thing is to elucidate what a proposition is, a thought in Frege's parlance. You know, the discourse did not converge on the term thought for this. And I do think it's way too ambiguous in a way. And it's way too psychologistic. To even correctly express, uh, you know, uh, felicitously express Frege's point of view. Um, so whatever can be true or false is a thought for Frege. We're calling that a proposition after, you know, at least one large strand of the whole discourse that comes after Frege. Nobody calls these things thoughts in the discourse anymore, unless they're elucidating Frege's uh, texts. Um, okay, so then he gives you a couple pages where he basically tries to characterize truth. You know, the as I often have said, the Moby Dick of philosophy, the great white whale. What is truth? He doesn't exactly define it. In fact, he argues that it cannot be defined. It's a, uh, or probably cannot be adequately defined. It's some kind of primitive, essential notion. And one thing we might ask, and Frege does ask this in one form or another, is um, if we give a definition of truth, how could we detect whether that definition was true? In other words, we have to know what truth is before we can assess any particular theory or definition of truth. I mean, a theory or definition of truth could be true according to itself and not be true. <laughs> um, so it might be that this truth is in principle undefinable and Frege does assert this, or at least he provisionally asserts it. Like he keeps saying, well, it may be that we can't do this. Uh, it may be that it's an unanalyzable primitive uh, concept. In fact, it might sort of be the only unanalyzable primitive concept in logic, ultimately, or uh, in epistemology. I'm not sure what he thinks about that. Um, so I'm going to try a couple passages on this. So this is on page two. First, I shall attempt to outline roughly how I want to use true, the word true, in this connection, so as to exclude irrele irrelevant uses of the word. True is not to be used in this, here in the sense of genuine or voracious. Like, um, you know, a true, um, you know, uh, true lemon flavoring or something like that. Right? Um, nor yet in a way it sometimes occurs in discussion of artistic questions. Like, ex does this novel express the truth? That's too woolly. For Frege, he wants to talk about like whether a scientific assertion or theory is true. I mean, he's not denying that there, there might be something interesting about claims about truth uh, with regard to works of fiction or works of art. Uh, not at all. But he's saying like, that's not the sense of the word true that we're interested in in logic. And it's, and it's quite right. I mean, in other words, like the novel is true. You're not going to be able to do anything with the truth of the novel in logic. You know, what are you going to do? Like start disassembling all the sentences about Madame Bovary and drawing inferences about the world or something like that. Um, so it's a different maybe sense or arena of truth or something like this than he is concerned with in relation to scientific and logical mathematical discourse. Um, or what he means by a thought. That is, when he, when he says that a thought is something that can be true or false, uh, what's the sense of true that he means? Not the sense in which Madame Bovary is true. Okay. Or, you know, Le Dem Demoiselle d'Avignon by Picasso is true. Um, okay. Uh, when people speak of truth in art, when truth is set up as the aim of art, when the truth of a work of art or true feeling is spoken of, like say true love, 
right? That's not, you know, that's a different use of the word true, according to Frege and people who follow Frege on this. Um, then the, then the bivalent true or false shows what's in reality or fails to sense that logic deals with uh, for Frege. Um, okay. Now, of course, the most uh, familiar theory of truth is the correspondence theory of truth. And man, we're going to see this kind of hovering in the background of a lot of these texts, this the questions about truth, sometimes directly addressed, sometimes, uh, you know, more implicit uh, in, some, in one way or another. Um, and, you know, so, all right, and the court... So the correspondence theory of truth, and we'll run, we'll be talking about this when we do some selections from Wittgenstein's Tractatus, um, is like, okay, a sentence is true, let's say, if it corresponds to reality, if it matches reality, if it accurately pictures reality, perhaps something like that. Now, you would think that with this kind of uh, Frege's objectivist framework, his, uh, his realist framework, you'd think that the correspondence theory would be congenial to him. But he sees deep conceptual logical problems with it. And these observations were, have been very, very influential as well. Uh, this is kind of a devastating, real quick refutation of the correspondence theory of truth. Um, Actually, I think this was published after Wittgenstein's Tractatus, so that's kind of interesting because I think um, maybe Wittgenstein, who has some version of a picture theory of truth in the Tractatus, maybe this was one of the texts that maybe uh, showed him that that was not going to work so well. Um, okay. So, first of all, truth is doesn't seem to express a relation at all okay truth does not seem to express a relation between a sentence and a reality it appears to as, uh, ascribe a particular property to a proposition or to a thought or whatever it is that is true or false um okay so to say that truth is a relation of correspondence of the thought to the reality goes against the use of the word true, he says on page three, which is not a relative term, that is, does not pick out a relation, and contains no indication of anything else to which something is to correspond. If I do not know that a picture is meant to represent Cologne Cathedral, then I do not know what to compare the picture with in order to decide its truth. A correspondence, moreover, can be perfect if the corresponding things coincide and so just are not different things. Like what degree of correspondence and what the hell does correspondence mean? But what degree of correspondence is necessary for truth? Right? Um, is an exact picture truer than a sketchy picture? Right. Is a sketchy picture false? You know? Or is it just true to a different degree or in a different way? But true, as Frege wants to use it in a logical sense, is bivalent. It's either true or not. But when we say a picture is accurate or not, and it's almost that analogy that is the correspondence theory is working on, of the relation of a sentence to what it's a sentence about, to a picture and what it's a picture of. Um, you know, is, is the accuracy of pictures a matter of degree? And, he's pointing out here, or just one way to put it, no picture is perfectly accurate. That would mean that it corresponded exactly to the thing it, of which it is a picture. That is, it would actually be the thing uh, of which it is a picture. You know, it would... It would what are we looking for? A perfect duplicate or something like this? But anyway, the, the point is like the relations are different, so they can't be the same relation. The relation of correspondence is one of degree, for example. Things correspond more or less 
to one another or resemble one another more or less, never perfectly, or they would be identical. But the relation of truth is yes or no, digital, bivalent, okay? Uh, so they, they can't, so correspondence can't be picking out the same relation as truth. It's actually a very clean and pretty devastating argument in a lot of ways. I mean, not that, not that you can't, you couldn't come up with some kind of response if you're uh, really working on it. Um, Okay, truth does not admit a more or less, he says. Um, all right. And, he says, the correspondence theory of truth entails an infinite regress. We should have to inquire whether it is true that an idea and a reality correspond in the specified respect. And then we should be confronted by a question of the same kind and the game should begin again. All right, so we're saying that the truth of this, let, let's work with pictures just to help it. The truth of this picture uh, lies in its, it, it, this picture is true because it corresponds to the reality it depicts. Okay, to assess that claim, we now have to assess the correspondence between the two. That is, we're going to have to assess the sentence. The picture corresponds to the reality. Is that sentence true? So then we'd be asking whether the sentence, the picture corresponds to the reality, corresponds to the reality. So, in a way, we'd be holding up the sentence. We, in order to do that, we'd have to hold up the proposition uh, next to the reality or the fact that it uh, corresponds to um, and reach a judgment about their resemblance, which in turn could be flawed. And then the question would arise again about the status of our judgment of their resemblance. And so you get an infinite regress of uh, claims of correspondence entailed by any claim to truth on the correspondence theory. Like I say, it's quick, and it's, uh, but it's really kind of killer. I must say that, uh, for example, William James was uh, developing similar uh, arguments against the correspondence theory, um, but not in the service of, of a kind of Freudian hard-nosed realism, but in the service of a pragmatic approach. Right. Uh, I like you know, I don't know if I quite did justice to that, um, but anyway, um, and also in that move where we're going like the picture of Cologne Cathedral matches up to the actual Cologne Cathedral. Um, where uh, we now we're assessing the truth of that sentence. When we enter into this regress, we're now, when we're trying to assess the, the truth of the picture of Cologne Cathedral, um, now, you know, that be, in, the, in the regress movement, that now becomes an assessment of the sentence. The picture resembles or, you know, accurately or corresponds to Cologne Cathedral. So what he says is that uh, actually even the correspondence of pictures to reality reduces to the correspondence of l language to reality. We're assessing sentences for truth, like that. that's an accurate description of uh, Cologne Cathedral, or that's an accurate picture of Cologne Cathedral. Um, so he wants to reduce these other kinds of truth, for example, pictorial, to linguistic. This is an example, it's done really quick here, but it's an example of what uh, became known as the linguistic turn in philosophy. You know, like we, we're taking, in a way you can recast any uh, philosophical claim in turn, as a linguistic claim. You know, are we... Uh, assessing the, are, are, are we trying to, you know, assert that the world is 
The universe is composed of monads. Right. Well, that's the same thing as trying to assess the truth of the sentence or the proposition the universe is composed of monads. Leibnizian monads. So we can make it a, a, a question straight up of language. And Frege right here is saying like, language is the locus of truth, fundamentally. Even, even in the case of pictorial truth or something like that, it reduces the truth of language. It has, for us to assess anything about it, it has to be recast into language. Um, and really it's an argument that, you know, quasi-linguistic items, propositions, thoughts, uh, are the fundamental locus of truth or even the fundamental data that we're dealing with in philosophy. This linguistic term, like how are we gonna deal with ethical questions? Analyzing the language of ethics. How are we gonna deal with metaphysical questions? Analyzing the language of metaphysics and perhaps showing that it's senseless, okay, etc. In a way, like at this moment, the most, all these traditional philosophical questions, and he's kind of explicitly saying this here, turn a corner into becoming questions of linguistic analysis. That's why philosophy of language is so central to the history of analytic philosophy, even as analytic philosophy has, you know, gone back to metaphysics, has gone way into ethics, has gone into political philosophy. Um, still, it rests on these kinds of moves uh, to an amazing extent. Um, all right. Um, so he defines a thought at the bottom of page four um, as something for which the question of truth can arise at all. That is, as we have defined proposition, something with a truth value. Um, okay, and uh, the minimum content of a proposition or a thought in Frege's parlance uh, is, as he says on the bottom of five, um, this thing has this property. That's the primitive proposition, the, the, the minimal condition for having something uh, analyzable in terms of truth or falsity. Uh, that it has, the, you know, uh, this apple is green. Right here from the South Mountain Fruit Belt. All right, I guess that's it for this one because I, uh, I, I want to just treat that, uh, you know, stuff about truth as, as somewhat the, a discrete topic. Um, and now, and then I'll, in a, you know, in a bit, I'll go on and do one uh, getting further into the piece than the first three pages or four pages. All right. <laughs>